pleasure to be here. I am uh, grateful for the invitation and grateful to add to the growing archive that this workshop seems to provide each year for both the students that are here presently and also those who may watch these videos that get recorded uh, in the aftermath. So um, as you can imagine, a topic like 2D material-based devices is a very broad topic. And we're going to cover many things throughout the day, some of them that are specific to materials, some of them that are uh, on other aspects of applications for 2D materials. So I figured they must want nothing more than me to arbitrarily decide what I will say. And that's what I've done. And as with most people, there will be a large amount of selectivity towards the work done in my group. Uh, owing to its familiarity and uh, the chance to be able to show you some of it. But uh, I will make a few perspective comments, both at the beginning as well as near the end of my talk. And if nothing else, to be honest with you, in a talk like this, with all that's out there in the literature, I think a change of perspective broadly on the area of 2D material-based devices would be the most effective use of the time that I'll spend with you today. So. Uh, this is the first perspective I want to offer. When it comes to any research field, whether we're talking about 2D materials, devices, or any other space that's out there, we don't want to do anything like is represented here, which is find the next new shiny material or system and make it be a solution to whatever problem is of current interest to us. And this has happened in many aspects uh, throughout the years, including with nanomaterials. And so what we want to avoid is allowing us to continue to search for materials and force them to be a solution to whatever problem it is that's at hand. So that's one thing to, to keep in our perspective when it comes to talking about device applications for these materials. So a couple of other points related to that are that we don't want applications for 2D materials just because. We want to do things that are meaningful, solve problems that we know we have, and there are plenty of them out there to be worth finding the right ones to solve. We also want to make sure and ask the question, could this really be done, whatever it is we're promoting uh, the 2D material for, could it really be done better with a 2D material than an existing solution or other type of material option? And finally, in summation, let's not do 2D just because it's 2D. Uh, let's find something that has real meaning and purpose in what we do. So I'll try to represent that through a few of the examples I'll give here. And this is an outline of what I'll go through. I'll give a brief introduction, though I'm going to work on the assumption that most everyone here has some background knowledge of 2D materials themselves and really go into talking about some specific ways they're used in devices. So, in thinking about 2D materials, I think it's best when we think of application spaces to understand what the primary advantages we have access to actually are. And I wrote this review a couple of years ago and highlighted four of those advantages that I would say generically apply to any nanomaterial where they are going to have the ability to be stacked onto any surface. You can create heterostructures because of that. They're obviously intrinsically thin in a physical sense and that has advantages for electronics. There is also the quantum confinement behavior that is a more intrinsic attribute rather than one that is variable because of a thinning effect that may happen with bulk materials. The fifth that I didn't talk a lot about in this review paper, but I think is of just as much importance for what we can do with these materials that is truly unique, is make use of their solution processability. And that compatibility of adding solution phase processing opens up a wide range of electronic applications that can't be accessed using the more traditional material platforms. So, Clarifying uh, kind of to the point I made a moment ago, when you look at the toolbox of nanomaterials more generally, and while I know we're talking about 2D materials as far as dimensional space in, with this particular summer school, uh, the reality is there are so many attributes that are shared in common with carbon nanotubes as a 1D nanomaterial that they're worth keeping into consideration when we talk about what we can do with them as a material set. What I want to make sure is clear though that when it comes to silicon or any other bulk material, thinning that down towards dimensional confinement is not the same thing as having a nanomaterial. And I know there could be some argument about uh, use of the terminologies, but I would just like to suggest that that is a nanostructure and it, it, in, it ends up having quantum confinement effects that are in virtually any aspect undesirable. 
uh, and wanting to be avoided versus those that have quantum confinement naturally and uh, that confinement is embraced as an, as an actual uh, desirable aspect of the material property. So there are papers uh, upon papers that will give you good background material on the classifications here. And I'm not going to walk through the details that I have on this slide. Uh, it's meant to just give a very high level uh, comparison amongst the options. But I am going to talk mostly about TMDs. And this shows a little bit of the X scenes. So I put the TMD one a little bit more uh, uh, magnified here. Uh, the idea is that we have a van der Waals layered structure from transition metal to chalcogenides and that you can use a wide array of different metal, transition metals as well as chalcogens uh, to, to yield these materials that have very similar structural properties but very different electronic, magnetic and other related properties. And some of those will be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think ex expounded upon in other application spaces throughout the day. But most of the research results that I'll show in my talk are from transition metal alkalogenides amongst the variety of two materials that are out there. So a couple more perspective slides and I'll get into some, some specific research results. Uh, this field is really unlike any other and it has to do with a couple of things. So first of all, when it comes to the number of papers published, and, and I know that there's folks who could argue with us from the medical community because, believe it or not, if you're not in that community, they have even more publications that you have to swim through in trying to determine what's happening in a space. But when it comes to the core scientific community, I really don't think there's ever been a field like 2D materials. And the question is whether or not that's meant as a good thing or a really bad thing. So for instance, if you were to search uh, just Google images for the number of publications versus year for 2D materials. You actually have many options for plots. First of all, you can have a plot that's just a simple bar graph. Now this bar graph, by the way, is plotted not as an accumulated total of the number of publications, but the actual publications per year for 2D materials. It's broken down by classification, but also in the purple, it's the total set. This is suggesting, and I can't verify these numbers, but just think about this for a second, that in 2015 alone, 5,000 papers were published related to 2D materials. 5,000. I don't think I've read that many my whole life. 5,000 papers, OK? Secondly, someone said, you know what? Forget this. We need a log scale. You simply cannot properly represent the total publications on a linear axis. And so they break it down by material and still have to show log scale to represent properly the growth that's occurred in some of the areas, such as MX scenes down here in the bottom right. So really, think for a moment about what the implications are. What is the net result of a massive flood of publications in a specific space? So here's another way to think about it in asking that question about is it a good thing. If you were to plot a new plot instead of the actual papers themselves, how about just the review papers? And this is just cursory data that I throw together from what I have saved in my archives. But we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 review papers on 2D materials. 50. I mean, think about as a new student entering a space. We used to live in a day, I started with carbon nanotubes, which arguably have a lot of stuff out there as well. But even then, in the mid-2000s, it was like, here are the three capstone review papers. Read these, you get a pretty good feel about what's going on. What do you do with this? I mean, wh which direction do you actually point a newcomer who wants to work in this field to take. And it's getting even worse because now we can actually make a plot of the number of journals that are specifically about 2D materials. And uh, there's no way to know whether or not this would continue to grow uh, in the years that will come. So we are entering a phase of a, really an untenable uh, situation with respect to tracking what happens in the science. And so my final perspective on this is, if you think about electron devices, devices in general from any material, regardless of what it is, if you were to go back into the early days of when Moore's Law was in its onset, you would have seen a few primary journals. Now, there were a couple more besides these, but really, these were the flagship. And what was in the periphery was minimal. And studying them uh, may be an exaggeration, but I'm thinking, you know, you sat at your desk and you got them in the mail once a month or so, and you peruse the articles of interest and stayed on top of the field. Now, 
in the time that's passed since then and journal after journal after journal. It's not just the journals that might specifically focus on, a, on an area. It's the fact that almost every journal out there will publish something related to devices from 2D materials. Even if it's not its core uh, audience, it'll still take papers that will cover something in the area. And so now we have more situations like this where there's really no ability to feel like you have a handle on everything that's happening in the space. And so every opinion that's offered is an entirely subjective biased opinion because there's no other opinion you could possibly have. You can't present the result and confidently know that something else out there has not already been discovered that's just like it. And that's a dangerous, in my opinion, a dangerous place to be in. I don't have a solution for it, but I think it's something that we need to think much more aggressively about when it comes to how to properly navigate research in this field going forward. Okay, all that being said, let me now subjectively offer you some perspectives about uh, specific research results that have come from my lab. So this is a review paper that talked about the various applications uh, in terms of devices from 2D materials. And I, for the sake of limited time, will only focus really on one, which are looking at electronic device applications. And uh, with that, I'll kick it off by first looking at interfacial issues. So regardless of what the device is, and that's you know, whether or not I'm talking about the electronic devices or I'm talking about biosensors or energy storage devices or piezoelectric devices, it really doesn't matter when it comes to interfaces because at the end of the day, every one of those applications is going to be often limited and even controlled by the interfaces between the outside world and the 2D material itself. And so what we do to establish those interfaces and how we understand that interaction is of paramount importance. So, whoops, sorry about that. So uh, let's think about a few of the unique aspects of the construct of a 2D material-based device. So the most basic transistor structure you can make, which would be some two-dimensional material laying on a substrate that serves as a global gate, and then the establishment of a couple of metal contacts to the surface to serve as source and drain. In that configuration, First of all, in the contacts, you have no out-of-plane bonding. Now, this is under some debate in terms of what the actual structure is between the metal and this van der Waals material. But from a high-level picture, you're not establishing bonds to available you know, covalent vacancies that would exist in a more traditional semiconductor material. So there's a unique interface there that we have yet to fully understand. The second is that whatever this material is resting on or whatever is on top of it is going to dictate the overall transport behavior. So there's going to be scattering events that are entirely dependent on that interfacial re interaction uh, with respect to how carriers are going to move through the material. And then thirdly, there are, because there are no uh, vacancies in the surface, you have no hydroxylation on the surface and therefore a lowered reactivity compared to a more traditional material surface. And this may sound like a really good thing, but it does actually produce some challenges. And part of the foremost of which is the ability to nucleate uniform dielectrics onto the surface of these materials. And I'll talk about some results in this space in just a moment. But I like to think about when you wonder what we do with these unique scenarios in a 2D material based device, maybe there's an opportunity actually that's related to those challenges. So for instance, these are a few of the examples I'll talk about is intentionally damaging, stacking, or even etching or treating the surface. A couple of these are things we would never think to do with traditional semiconducting materials and yet are really potentially advantageous when it comes to using 2D materials. So first of all, with respect to the nucleating of, of ultra-thin dielectrics. So if you were to use the most standardized approach for getting ultra-thin, high-quality dielectrics onto a two-dimensional surface, uh, you would use atomic layer deposition. So that's the industry standard for controlled growth, high-quality material yield. And if you did that, if you just took an MOS2, we'll say, uh, surface, and put it into an ALD reactor and grew 10 nanometers of aluminum oxide, the most traditional uh, ALD process high K material. You would end up with what you see in this AFM image here, which is on the SiO2 surface where the MOS2 material is not, you get a nice smooth uh, overall uniform deposition. But where the MOS2 is, you get these uh, random nucleation that turns into essentially 10 nanometer diameter balls of material. 
And the, the fact that you get this sporadic nucleation at all is, uh, rela is related somewhat to the presence of defect sites on the material. And secondly, related to just the fact that you get enough co-reactants in the system at any given time, and you end up getting some randomized nucleation that will occur, or adsorbed precursor molecules. But at the end of the day, it's not what you want. And so how do we get to a place where we can get scalable, thin, high-quality dielectrics on the surface? Well, a few things have been tried over the years. Uh, two camps that are the most uh, significant to identify would be surface treatments and buffer layers. So surface treatments, Anything that you're doing to that two-dimensional surface that is in, in its native state inert and using this process to create a non-inert surface or one that's going to offer reactive sites for nucleating the needed growth. And that includes a lot of things outside of what I show here. I show, show two of the most prominent, which is using a UV ozone and uh, using an O2 plasma. And as you can imagine, the intent there is really intentional damage, and that has downsides to it. The other is to use buffer layers. So metal oxide buffer layers have been pretty common, as have been molecular buffer layers. And in both cases, the idea, the idea is that can I use a different deposition technique to establish an initial layer that I can then nucleate onto. And they've had really decent success with this, but from a transistor point of view, it does add to the equivalent oxide thickness, and that is, at the end of the day, not a desirable outcome when it comes to getting the best possible stack of dielectric materials. So are there other options? And the one that I'll show you that we've developed in my lab is a very straightforward one because most ALD reactors have this capability built into them, and that is using a plasma enhanced step for the oxidant pulse rather than just a thermal ALD process step. So first of all, I want to be clear about the impact of using a plasma in this type of an ALD approach. So if you look at the system uh, schematic that I have on the right hand side of the slide here, uh, the plasma itself is a remote plasma, a plasma that's upstream from the actual ALD reaction chamber. So that means that as you can see in the diagram, the plasma is striking up at the top of the reactant chamber, and downstream here, it's going to eventually be exposed to the substrate, but that is through a shower head. So shower head, in this case, has openings that are only around the perimeter of the shower head itself, and that makes sure that there is no line of sight access for energetic plasma byproducts to actually interact with the surface of this 2D material. So whatever the byproducts are for promoting the reaction, they would actually have to move to the edges of the shower head to make it through, and therefore you eliminate some of the energetic interactions that may occur in a more traditional direct plasma scenario. Um, but at the end of the day, in terms of the difference between ALD from a thermal process and one that has a plasma enhanced process, you're really just introducing a new mechanism for providing energy into the system that will promote the overall growth of a material. And the, result, the resulting difference is actually rather staggering. So using uh, plasma enhanced ALD versus just traditional thermal ALD and growing the same thickness of material, uh, you can see the difference across temperatures at the top with thermal ALD and the bottom with plasma enhanced ALD, where if you get up to the 330 range, uh, degrees Celsius range, you have a film that is really nice and uniform using the plasma enhanced approach versus that still sporadic nucleation that occurs with thermal ALD. And if you look at the phase diagram for that, it's even more convincing that you really do get a nice uniform film that covers across the surface of the MOS2, just the same as it does with the surrounding silicon oxide surface that it's resting on. So scalability-wise, for using this nucleation approach, we showed down to about 3 nanometers thick high K dielectrics. This is both with aluminum oxide and hafnium oxide, so around 30 cycles of growth, and you yield around the 3 nanometer range for the thickness of the film. And to show what actually may be happening with the interface there to the material, uh, we did build some devices. So in this case, we initially build some substrate-gated devices. That's what's shown here in this schematic uh, of MOS2. And then and did an initial characterization and then grew a layer on top of that overall device and tested it again using the back gate. And this is not a perfect mechanism for understanding exactly what's happening with respect to the nucleation on the electrical properties. There are, uh, for instance, are potential impacts on the contact interface from being exposed to the thermal environment.
environment of the ALD. We accounted for that uh, in this particular process, and you can read more about it in the paper here. Uh, but there are other things as well. There are capacitive effects that could be occurring. Uh, so I don't want to pretend like this captures the full picture. But I am still going to suggest that the result itself is rather fascinating because while you look at aluminum oxide at the top, the blue curve in the back is the initial curve before ALD, and the green curve is after the plasma enhanced ALD of aluminum oxide. As may be expected, there's some degradation that occurs, both in terms of the switching behavior for the off state as well as the on state performance of the device. But, as was not expected in the hafnium oxide case, you don't see that same trend. Uh, in the before case, which is the blue curve here, versus the after case, which is the purple curve, you see an actual enhancement, both in off-state behavior with respect to a reduced hysteresis, and with respect to the on-state current uh, in the operation of the device. So what could be yielding an outcome like this, I don't want to suggest is the fact that it's doing no damage to the crystal itself. It's got to nucleate somehow, and this is a multi-layer MOS2, not a monolayer, and so it's not uh, unlikely that there's going to be some damage that's occurring. But the net result, when you add all of the factors into the situation of putting this ultra-thin layer onto the surface of the material is actually a positive net result when it comes to these devices. So we further showed the scalability with a top gate dielectric from the material. So this is a three to four nanometer thick hafnium oxide dielectric used as the top gate dielectric. And you can see in the subthreshold plot, uh, the fact that the leakage current remains down uh, re really low, especially considering the fact that you have a dielectric that's EOT is below one nanometer in this case. Okay, so switching gears to the other aspect of interfaces, which are the contact interfaces. And this is one that uh, arguably remains the most uncertain in the area. While you can go and find some papers that provide some theoretical perspectives about what may be happening at these interfaces, there has yet to be a conclusive one that truly captures the unique nature of them. And l largely because we don't actually know if there is a consistent unique nature to these interfaces. It may change with every TMD you use, every other 2D material you use, and every metal and in deposition condition that you may use. But what I show here are a couple of review papers that have looked at this. Uh, actually, this one's not a review. This is recently published one that uh, suggests that in addition to potentially different interfacial effects that could modify band structure at that metal 2D interface, there may also be actual phase transitional effects that are occurring in that 2D material based upon the interaction between the metal and its surface. And so that just opens up a whole new avenue of considerations that has to be added in potentially for understanding what happens at these interfaces. So what I want to show is one of the ways that we have worked on in my lab to try and uh, adjust the interface for a hopefully more favorable electron transport scenario. So this is getting kind of zooming out as an experimentalist and just looking at the practical side of the picture. So we may not understand all that's going on under the hood here, and eventually people do need to understand this, but we're just looking at it and saying, hey, we've got a material, there's no covalent bonding interaction naturally between this non-reactive inert surface and a metal that's essentially just laying on top of it. So what if we promoted covalent bonds and uh, developed what are typically called edge state or edge contact interaction uh, between the metal and this material? And maybe contact uh, carrier injection would be improved. So we use a system that we have in my lab that uh, focusing mostly on the right hand side of this cluster tool, which we call a sulfur, sort of a surface prep system. It adds uh, a thin film deposition capability, which is an electron beam evaporator with what's called an ion beam source. And if you're unfamiliar with these ion beam sources, you can think of it kind of like a plasma, but it's one that can be struck and maintained in UHV. And it's a directional plasma, so it has a directionality to it that allows for the plasma to strike and then be aimed towards the surface uh, where the sample is resting in a chamber. So what we did is de design some devices that allowed us to, in situ, without breaking the UHV, expose the contact region selectively to this ion beam, and therefore roughening or modifying the crystal structure, and then subsequently deposit the metal without ever breaking the vacuum. So you have no chance for other types of unwanted reactants to uh, enter and, and create bonds before you get your metal in place. This is pivoted by uh, work that had happened previously, several studies actually, this is just one of them 
from years ago at IBM uh, looking at graphene, purposely creating these cuts in the graphene in the contact region in order to promote this type of injection at bond sites rather than just having to tunnel across some van der Waals gap that may exist between the two materials. So the net result of using this ion beam modification was the ability to yield improvement in the devices. Uh, you can see that in the IV curves up at the top. And the way that we came about observing this was by using uh, isolated exfoliated flakes of molybdenum disulfide and creating sets of devices on the same flake one set having the ion beam exposed to those regions prior to contact metallization, and the other set having the devices not exposed and therefore developed in the traditional fabrication fashion. And most interesting of all, if you look at the ratio of uh, current change for the devices that had the ion beam modification versus those that did not, so ultimately, if you see an above one number here, it means you got an enhancement in the on-state current performance. You can see that with just a few seconds of ion beam exposure, there's up to four times an increase in the on-state conduction for these overall devices. Of course, there is going to be a transition point where you do more damage than good, and that is seen here where you expose above 10 seconds or so, and you start to actually create more defect and maybe lateral transport issues than you're actually solving in terms of contact injection uh, benefits. So what is actually happening here? Obviously, you're purposely generating defects and damaging the material, uh, and that's what this analysis shows through some Raman and XPS data. But the most important takeaway from this slide is that in the XPS data, we learned that there was more than just the metal we had intended to deposit that was going down onto the surface. So through further investigation, we came to realize that this ion beam source we had was not actually focusing in on the substrate. It was more of a broad beam that was exposing across the chamber, which means means that there was a sputtering effect of metals on the walls of the chamber that could be contributing to the result that we see here. So more recently, this is work that we're still developing uh, to publish, but we've adapted our tool, put a gridded ion source in there that offers more focusing, and uh, we've ensured that that source does remain focused on the substrate itself, and we see an even more pronounced uh, potential improvement in the overall device characteristics. Okay. So moving to scaling. So those are my comments with respect to interfaces. Now I'll give three examples of device areas where there's a lot of active work. I'll go a little quickly through some of these things. Uh, so with respect to scaling in transistors, two important things to keep in mind for making a transistor of any material and knowing that it should be scalable. First is the one that everyone tends to know about, Moore's Law. We need the device to be smaller. There are a lot of other implications to that as plotted through the, the other curves that are in this plot here, the blue, red, and green, uh, that I won't get into. But the net challenges are that you have short channel effects by scaling, scaling the channel length. You have quantum confinement issues with traditional semiconductor materials. And you have limits in the overall processing. But just as important, but having received much less attention, is the ability to scale the operating voltage of the transistors. And this curve is showing the fact that in the classic Denard scaling regime, we eventually did a decent job of this. There were generations of which we did not choose to scale overall operating voltage, and we we're fine with that because of the size and power uh, draw of the technologies. But when it came to the point where we knew we needed to, we eventually hit a bottleneck. So in, in, honestly, if I were to interpret the progress of Moore's law and to capture all aspects of transistor devices, I would say the first really substantial roadblock that was fully hit was this ability to scale operating voltage in the early 2000s. And that's a roadblock we have yet to get past. And we try to chisel away at it here and there, mostly for specific applications. But the overall result for high performance computing is that we still run over a volt when it comes to transistor operating voltage in order to get sufficient performance at the transistor level. So a real solution to scaling is one that solves both of these. And something that is both a device and material that are scalable in size, as well as an overall voltage performance uh, scalability. So first, I'll talk a little bit about size. When you're scaling the size of a transistor, the most important dimension based upon the volume of work that's been done would be the channel length. And why most important, what we really mean is the fact that we knew it was going to be a problem years ago. We knew there was going to be an electrostatic 
reduction of control when it comes to a gate modulating semiconductor bands. And the best way to represent that, in my opinion, is in the full electrostatic pic picture, which means looking at the Poisson equation and the potential profile through a transistor and taking out this one parameter that drops out of the Poisson expression, which is known as the screening or natural length. It's basically an indication of the distance, physical distance, over which the bands would modulate at, two, at a junction between a semiconductor material and another material. And so if that distance is big, then you have a warping of the bands that's not ultimately controlled by the gate. If that distance is small, then your gate maintains strong control in the actual channel region that is not uh, inhibited by whatever is happening at the interface with the contacts. Okay? So you want a very small screening length ultimately. And that can come through a thin body or channel thickness, regardless of whatever that channel is, and uh, scaling the overall electrostatic picture, which is the EOT and the permittivity. So when it comes to nanomaterials generally, of course we have an intrinsic advantage. These materials are naturally extremely thin. So from an electrostatic picture, you're going to couple with them in a way that is far more efficient than materials that are limited in any bulk type fashion. And so what you see here is a composite that I plotted a year or so ago uh, that looks at all types of nanomaterial channels and what we were able to observe in terms of subthreshold swing switching behavior uh, versus the actual gated channel length. And you can see that in the last five to six years, well, we've had a lot of demonstrations, including some that go below the 10 nanometer gate length range which has not ever been really breached by any type of traditional semiconductor material with a device that performs uh, in, in a good fashion. So that's encouraging. But it's not the only side of the picture. So channel length scaling is significant, but when you look at scaling a transistor technology, the gate pitch is the most significant dimensional scaling parameter, often referred to as CPP. And that contact gate pitch is something that swallows up both a channel and a contact length. And so the length of the contact matters just as much. Well, you may not realize that when it comes to silicon devices, that contact length, which is seen as the full contact plug in this cross-sectional picture here, is a significant scaling bottleneck, even for silicon, because you end up incurring in, you know, uh, deleterious effects on the contact resistance as you go below what's known as the transfer length, which is kind of thought of as the length over which most carriers will inject in a contact interface between a metal and a semiconductor. When it comes to 2D materials, do we have the same problem? The answer is yes, based upon what we've learned so far from experimental data. You can see here that if you plot the contact length, which is just the length that that metal covers the material, the, whatever the, the channel material is, uh, as you get below a transfer length, in this case it's said around 30 nanometers, you end up having a significant drop in the current in the device because of this increased resistance at the contact interface. So what can we do about that? The uh, recent work that we've done in my lab uh, has been looking at developing full edge contacts. And this is something that was demonstrated for graphene a number of years ago and has been since demonstrated uh, on a case or two for some 2D materials that are semiconducting, but none of them have actually produced a result that shows true scalability out of that edge interface. So what we show here is a comparison between putting what most people use for contacts, which we'll call top contacts that essentially rest on top of the material, versus a pure edge interface uh, between the semiconductor material and the metal itself. And the idea is, can we get to this scenario where we have edge contacts yielding a, um, an immunity to the scaling of the size of the contacts themselves so that we preserve the performance in spite of the size scalability? Okay, so the process we used was the one I introduced just before using that in situ ion beam capability so that we don't expose the reactant centers that are, that are generated in the 2D material uh, to the ambient before the metallization occurs. And it, this is showing a more uh, refined development of the etching of uh, the materials using the ion beam. And you can see here, if we etch the material out and then expose it to the ambient, that you actually can see the reactivity of the edges of the MOS2 in this AFM scan, where you have some species that have reacted there and formed some type of a material structure at the edges where they've been exposed. So uh, the result in terms of the devices, this is showing the impact for tri-layer MOS2 as well as monolayer MOS2. So this particular, these particular devices are using CVD-grown layers of MOS2. 
And you can see in this cross-sectional TEM for the tri-layer, the abrupt interface between the nickel contact and those three layers that go into the channel. And in both cases, the tri-layer as well as the monolayer case, the good news is that comparing a device that is above the transfer length, which has been published to be around 30 nanometers, and one that is below the transfer length, which in this case we go to around 20 nanometers, that the performance of those devices is uh, highly consistent. And so it shows this type of immunity to scaling. Um, if you were to look at that for uh, several different metals, and we're showing two of the ones that we studied here, chrome and uh, nickel, you can see that both offer this type of immunity when using edge contacts. Uh, but of course, one metal versus the other does yield a difference in net performance of the devices. And you can see that with respect to the on current that's plotted here. So in respect to voltage scaling, I'm sorry, there's a lot of gear shifts in this talk because I'm covering a bit of a broad spectrum of material. So voltage scaling uh, in addition to the size scaling. One of the things I want to go through for students that may not understand how to interpret what's happening in a transistor is if you look at the subthreshold plot of a transistor, the ID versus VGS curve, this is what you'd see. And if we ask the question, why can't we just reduce VDD to get to a lower supply voltage uh, by using a simple lower number? The answer is that yes, we can reduce VDD, and some technologies even do this and sell chips that are the same overall transistor technology but running at a different voltage. Uh, but the loss of on current in a high performance computing scenario is completely unacceptable, even if it is only a sort of linear uh, scale loss. The second would be then, well, why don't we just reduce the threshold voltage that we're using to turn the device on? That would look a little bit like this. And the answer becomes a linear decrease in threshold voltage yields an exponential increase in the off current. And for the last 15, 20 years, we've used the off current as the metric to design to. We know what we, we can survive at a limit for off current. And so we design everything else around making sure that that limit is met. So finally, why don't we just make the subthreshold swing steeper? Well, Sounds easy enough when you're plotting it with PowerPoint physics like this. Uh, but as anyone who's worked with tunnel FETs would tell you, it is not easy at all. And uh, has had a lot of challenges when it comes to how to overcome this particular limit. So I'm going to make a few comments. And I'm going to do this quickly, even though this is a topic that could be talked about at great length, um, about negative capacitance transistors. So this is becoming a very hot topic in the broad device community. And by broad device community, I mean industry labs are working on this. Academic labs are working on this. They're covering the spectrum in terms of interest levels. All right? So it's not just a 2D material thing. And uh, you can see that with kind of this plot of number of papers over here. But the, the idea is that if I were to add a ferroelectric material into the gate stack of a transistor with the dielectric still in place, that I could capitalize on the rapid polarization that occurs in a ferroelectric in order to effectively amplify the applied gate voltage. Okay? And the idea would be that amplification yields me more surface potential modification versus gate voltage than I could get in a traditional sense. So this originated 10 years ago by uh, Saif Salahuddin and Supriyo Dada at Purdue University. They developed a theoretical picture that said, hey, what if we put a ferroelectric in there? It's got this polarization behavior. So a normal dielectric, if you're, if you're curious, would just be linear. Okay, so this one is nonlinear and in fact has this very abrupt polarization that occurs and then a remnant polarization that exists. But it also has intrinsic hysteresis. It's part of the element of how these materials operate under an applied field. And that's why they've been used mostly in memory devices like ferroelectric FETs. And that is, we want the hysteresis to preserve state. We don't want hysteresis in this case, and so there has to be a way of suppressing it. And part of the way is by using the ferroelectric in series with a dielectric and having a different capacitive matching network set up because of that. Um, but the result from their theory was that you would end up with a pronounced modulation in surface potential versus the applied gate voltage. Is it a reality? Well, this is one of many of these papers that have been published that can show you using silicon thin FETs, so even down to some groups showing 22 nanometer technology, where all they did to change the silicon thin FET was add in a thin hafnium oxide doped material that's ferroelectric into the gate stack and observed an improvement in the overall subthreshold swing, including some observation of switching below the thermal limit of 60 millivolts per decade. So what we've done in my group is tried to 
embrace this idea that we need both a size and voltage scalable transistor and explore the potential of doing that with a two-dimensional channel material in a negative capacitance transistor. That's what's shown here using a poly uh, vinylidine PVDF TRFE polymeric ferroelectric. Frankly, it's a fairly terrible ferroelectric material. Uh, it's not very stable and uh, causes a lot of issues with respect to doing detailed characterization. But we were able to observe, nevertheless, on a couple different devices with different channel lengths, uh, if we were to operate the device with the back gate, we got the traditional curve. But if we operated it with this top gate with the ferroelectric included in the gate stack, we had a very pronounced switching behavior that got far below the subthreshold swing that was expected for thermal limit at 60 millivolts per decade. Since then, we've refined this more, as other groups have as well, and uh, we published a year ago uh, the use of this doped hafnium oxide, hafnium zirconium oxide, ferroelectric right here in a bottom gate stack with an interlayer metal here between the ferroelectric and the dielectric material. That allowed us to characterize the device using just the dielectric and then the same exact device using the gate with the ferroelectric. And the overall result you can see here that the switching behavior when we use this more extended gate stack with the ferroelectric has a much more pronounced switching behavior uh, far below 60 millivolts per decade over several order of mags of, orders of magnitude of current. And uh, that's just another way of looking at that and the capacitive network. What I don't want to pretend for you is that this is a slam dunk case. There are certainly challenges to this. The fact that this is more of a transient negative capacitance effect is probably the most substantial one. That means that there is some asymmetry in the hysteretic behavior of the curves. Even if you show no hysteresis, so to speak, at a given current, there's still asymmetry when it comes to the sweep direction, which is unacceptable, obviously, if you're wanting a robust technology. So that's something that's been debated heavily. I'm going to skip over this uh, for the sake of time. But it's been debated heavily amongst other 2D negative capacitance papers. And ultimately, in this broad question about what is the switching speed limit for these devices generally. If we have something that's working off of an arguably clunky uh, atomic motion behavior inside of a film that leads to this sort of polarization, then it's never going to be fast enough. But recent studies, which are still debated in the community very heavily, uh, have suggested that if you get rid of this multi-domain transient ferroelectric that's typically used and instead scale it to where you get towards a single domain and uh, are able to do that in a device that yields effectively stable negative capacitance behavior, then you can actually get below picosecond uh, overall transient with respect to this switching. And that would be plenty sufficient for the speed that would be competitive in a traditional CMOS platform. So it's encouraging at this point, but something that certainly needs to be demonstrated in a more robust fashion. So, okay, uh, sake of time, I'm going to actually kind of blast through this slide and just point out that there are good things with respect to size and voltage scaling in 2D, but there are also some ser serious challenges. And I kind of pose the question, uh, will we ever be interested in addressing these? You know, variability, uh, realistic device structures, material problems that are abounding. I don't know. Uh, right now, no, because all we want to do is the next big shiny thing. And the variability is not a big shiny thing. It's, uh, it's somewhat dull when it comes to getting people excited. But it's just as imperative to do. OK, so um, I'm going to tune a little bit for my time. So stacking is something I'm not going to talk a lot about. Uh, and I'll close out with my real comments on printing. So for stacking, I'll just have, I just have three slides to comment on. One, the, the three slides are made out of three different ways to stack 2D materials. One is what I would call interdigitated stacking in a transistor. This is something we did years ago at IBM with graphene. I think there's a recent paper where someone did this with some 2D uh, semiconducting materials. But you, know, you have a material that's not substrate bound. You want a lot of current in your device. Fantastic. You can stack layer upon layer upon layer and gate them all independently. So that's a really nice size scaling, uh, performance scaling capability. It's not all that different from where we're moving in the broad silicon-based industry. So now folks are talking about not just using nanowires, uh, which we used to be able to show stacking like this, but to get enough current, they're actually talking about these nano sheets that are stacked. So basically like a near 2D material from silicon, but not one that yet incurs quantum confinement effects uh, that's stacked in order to amplify the current. The other type of stacking would be heterostructures. This is a huge, huge part of the 2D material and device field. And uh, I show a few examples here of what's been done with that. It's fantastic work. It's a very unique type of heterostructure that uh, has obviously produced the ability to 
you make devices that we can't make with more traditional materials. And so it's, it's one that's growing still. And the third area for stacking would be integrational stacking. So 3D type circuits where we're putting functional devices at uh, discrete layers. And you can't do that when you have a process that requires high thermal budget, for instance. Um, and this offers the chance to go low temperature and put functional electronic devices at different layers. So a lot of exciting things in that space. OK, so in my last few minutes, uh, I want to talk about printing and then uh, close with a couple perspectives. So first of all, when you hear the word printing, and we've been working on this for a few years in my lab, uh, I've, I've now recognized the need to clarify what's meant. Because most people, when you say printing nowadays, they think about 3D printers. And in fact, when you, you can give a whole talk on printed electronics, and then someone will say something about 3D printing, and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, they weren't listening at all. So, uh, so I want to make really clear that there's a difference between 3D printing, like this bunny here, and you can buy these sort of things at fairly low cost, and doing electronics type printing, which would be forms of 2D printing. So one would be printing onto existing structures or substrates, like shown with these printers. The other would be a roll-to-roll -roll or highly manufacturable printing approach. This one is a direct printing. This one is a high-volume high manufacturing printing. Both are on two-dimensional surfaces. Okay? And I'm going to talk mostly about these sort of guys in print electronics. So you have to be careful here, though. So there's a little caveat that I like to show, including to the researchers that are in my lab. Um, we talk about printed electronics. We talk about flexible electronics. And we talk about them because they just sound so dang cool, right? I mean, the idea of going up to a printer, clicking a button, and out prints out something on a piece of paper that's functional electronically, it sounds amazing. But is it actually needed? Is it actually a useful outcome? And that's the, the question I sort of pose to my students. So let me give you an example. When it comes to printed electronics, the thing most people know about are printed RFIDs, which is, by the way, one of the, one of the most irritating marketing misnomers that uh, I can think of. Because the only thing printed in an RFID is this antenna. And we've been able to print these metal traces for decades. So there's nothing novel about that. It's just a printed metal trace. And uh, that's what makes the printed RFID, except Wait a minute, a printed metal trace does nothing other than provide us some signal interaction. So if we want a brain in there, we have to get functional components. And none of those are printed when it comes to RFIDs that we get on the market these days. And so here's an example. I took my kids to this water park place. And it gives you these wristbands that they all get. And they, they're so cheap, you get to keep them. Right? So they're that cheap. And they let you in your room. And they let you in the water park. And so of course, I got home and cut mine open. And uh, this is the little tag that's inside. So I asked my students. How big is the silicon chip on this, uh, uh, controlling this RFID to make sure that no one else gets into my room and they know it's me when I go places? So it has to be pretty discreet. Uh, how big is it? And they all want to say it's underneath this square here, which is still pretty small, by the way. But it's not. It's this little tiny speck right there. In fact, if you look it up and you want to learn about these, look up silicon dust, because that's what they call these chips. They're so cheap, they're so small, and they have several thousand transistors on them. And so if you have a technology like that, what are you going to do better when it comes to flexible electronics or printed electronics with nanomaterials? You have to be really, really honest, in my opinion, when it comes to motivating what you're going to suggest you're going to do in that space. And that's something that we've fallen into a really deep pit with respect to a lot of the work that we do in this area. So you're probably left wondering, so why on earth talk about printed electronics at all? Because I actually think there are motivations for doing it. It's just not to upset that apple cart. That one is really, really, in my opinion, in good shape. So what would we use additive or roll-to-roll -roll printing for in these approaches? Uh, well, most of it is by having to answer this question. What can nanomaterials do that silicon cannot do? And so if you think about it, I want to also add to the running a sort of pretty much two-dimensional nanomaterial, <laughs> which is a film of carbon nanotubes. And uh, arguably, a tangled network film is pretty much 2D. And uh, that's one of the best materials we can use. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, these are ready in terms of integration solution-wise, so that we can make inks out of them and print them. And those solutions come in all forms, not just na uh, nanotubes, but all types of liquid exfoliated two-dimensional materials that you can get. And you know, the net idea is that if I can print these, they'll stack up, and I can maybe make devices out of a very low-cost fabrication approach. And in terms of performance, there's a lot of promise there. So printed CNTs we know really well. They can compete with metal oxides in terms of mobility, which is the most important metric when thin film conduction is concerned, and, and in terms of on-current behavior. Printed 2D, that's uh, a real question mark. So I threw them up there just to be optimistic 
but uh, there's very little that we know about them, and they don't form these nice, beautiful, thin layers like nanotubes will uh, because they're bigger and, you know, clunkier. So you're not going to just form into a nice 2D film. And uh, what we do in my lab is aerosol jet printing of these inks, and that forms uh, decent layers. And we've done fully printed uh, devices from carbon nanotubes and contacts as well as dielectric materials. And we also, more recently, have done some work on, on well, I'll get to that in a second. Let me make a comment about this. So, Printing 2D materials. This is still one of the more infant areas for 2D semiconducting crystals. Um, and look, it's exciting. That's why you can make a pretty crappy transistor and publish it in science when it comes to printing 2D materials, because it's something that people can get excited about. Uh, but I think it's important to be careful about suggesting that there's any advantage to this versus carbon nanotubes. Or at the very least, be honest enough to benchmark it against nanotubes because it's also a nanomaterial, it's also stable in air, and it's also printable. So you can't just make these devices and suggest that there's value to the broad community because it happens to be done out of a new material. So uh, one of the things we do is use 2D materials that are not semiconducting, like for, for instance, nanoflakes that are conducting, and use those in order to print contacts so that we have more control over the morphological structure and the interface between those and a really good known printed semiconductor like carbon nanotubes. So the result is that we can make these really nice devices where every layer is printed, and in this case, these kind of nanoflakes and the nanotubes is the channel. And even more so, we've been able to use this to develop these print-in-place transistors. So I know that if you don't do printed electronics, you're probably thinking, oh, cool, you load something into a printer, and you click the button, and it prints the whole transistor, and then you go test it. No one does that. So they load it in the printer and they take it out and they spin something on it. And they load it in the printer and they take it out and they bake it. And they load it in the printer and they, on and on and on and on through each step. And so it's not a practical implication or application for doing printed electronics from these materials. So what we did is said, hey, can we load this substrate in and take it out and test the device? So from start to finish of all of the functional layers. And that's what we did in this recent paper. It just came out a month or so ago. Um, and so there's a lot of possibility. And this is my last slide and then I'll close up the talk. Um, is just to keep kind of make your mind work down what would be a useful way to use nanomaterials in this way. Well, there are sensors that can be made using nothing other than nanomaterials. So you won't get sensitivity out of silicon or other materials in the same way. An example that we've done in my lab are these tire tread depth sensors, measure the thickness of a tire from inside of the tire. And another one is biological immunoassays. I noticed there's someone who's going to talk about biosensors later today much more comprehensively, so I kept it out of this talk, but it's something that we do a lot of work on in my lab. And we just kicked off a startup a, a few months ago with these tire sensors, uh, a 4.5 million Series A, that shows the type of value you can get from nanomaterial electronics in a very practical uh, application that can't be accessed using traditional materials. So my closing perspectives are, let's be more open to how we benchmark devices from these materials so that we can make logical decisions about whether it's really worth going down all of these paths. We're already smothered with, material, with journals. We're already smothered with papers. Why don't we try to trim a little bit and be more honest about how we benchmark things? So I put this little table together to say, hey, here's materials. Here's things that I talked about. Do you disagree? Fantastic. That's great. Let's argue about it. Let's disagree and come to some you know, way that we should be doing research to make decisions and not just create the next big flashy, shiny star in the sky that no one will ever see. And that's what I hope happens in the future for this area. So uh, in conclusion from that, be more, be more uh, realistic when it comes to looking at problems and finding materials that are the right solution for those problems. So summarize my talk there, but I really want to make sure and acknowledge the great folks that really did this work from my lab uh, and the funding agencies that supported us. And if I have any time left, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. On the, uh, um, when you start the scaling of the, uh, um, uh, the 2D material transistors and you know, what, what are the, the gate lengths, um, some of those have still the top contacts, right? And so the electrostatic length mm -hmm. actually extends into the region underneath the contacts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how big of a problem is that? Or, or if people have these edge contacts, if you look at like, the scalability of those, mm -hmm. those might actually have 
there you actually are now containing the electrostatic length of the device. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Steve. So th there's a paper I just became aware of, but came out uh, end of 2017 from Jorg's group, Jorg Appenzeller at Purdue, uh, that talks about the impact of gate modulation on the contact behavior. I've, I found it really insightful for putting into context the scalability that you're talking about, because I totally agree. I mean, the, the overall electrostatic picture is much bigger than just focusing in on the channel for those devices. Uh, but you're also right that, that we are motivated by the edge contacts in that modulation becomes limited only to the known, you know, traditional region of interface between the semiconductor and the metal. And so it's encouraging from a scaling picture. So, uh, David, can you comment on uh, the advantage and disadvantage between uh, electrostatic doping and chemical doping? Like, mm -hmm. for, especially for 2D materials, since that is 2D, we can use electrostatics to, uh, for example, a back gate to create N and P type channel versus mm -hmm. chemical doping. Yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, with respect, I, and I obviously didn't even touch on doping in a whole talk about devices from these types of materials. But uh, my opinion is that with respect to chemical doping, that we really have yet to come to a place where there's something that's robust and reproducible in terms of its doping effects. I mean, we have to, uh, this is something, in my opinion, we have to think about the comparison to what we're used to with doping for silicon. We dope silicon in a way that, of course, has some randomness to it, but we've developed it over the years to know exactly what the carrier concentration will be giving the doping parameters. And we're realistic enough in silicon to say, oh, you know what, our devices are so small now, we can't dope the channel anymore because you know 10 to the 18 dopant concentration would be three atoms in my channel, and I can't control that. And so now they're intrinsic. And so uh, I think there's a lot of realism there that we need to think about with 2D materials. Is it even practical to talk about doping chemically when you're talking about devices that are used for scaling size because the number of dopant atoms would be so few. Uh, so that's chemical doping. And electrostatic, I mean, it, it's just a size thing. So if there's a device application where you can use a gate to effectively dope, then I, I personally think it's a pretty robust, reproducible way to do it. It's just, is it practical in a device? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in the interest of time, I think we should move on. So let's thank Aaron again for the very nice uh, talk.